I'm going to give you a little overview on where we stand with the FEG, the Fachkräfte Einwanderungsgesetz. Um, I'm going to refer to it as the FEG. Um, that's the German abbreviation, and um, probably that's the easiest. Otherwise, we lose too much time speaking or saying the name. Um, and um, I'll give you an introduction to what the FEG is about and also um, where it stands right now. Uh, Julia already mentioned it. It could have had chosen. It could have chosen a better time to enter into force, but um, well, it was just bad luck, I guess. Um, so um, we'll have to see how the pandemic has influenced, of course, the implementation. And, and I will address this in the later part of the presentation. Um, but before we go into the FEG, I want to give you a couple of statistics and um, common perceptions about the um, the German immigration system, which led maybe in parts to the FEG being introduced. So um, when we look at the discussion of the last years in Germany, um, we very um, we, we heard a lot of times from different angles, almost from everyone basically, that the German labor migration system is quite slow, it's quite complex, um, and at the same time, there's a huge demand for skilled workers, which cannot be fully satisfied by EU free movement, um, and that the system and the visa categories are actually kind of antiquated, doesn't even have a uh, points-based system or anything like that. So this is what the discussion sounded like and looked like, I would say, in the last one to two decades, actually. Um, and um, let, let's look at this a bit closer. Um, we have a, a map here. This is a, um, a, a map which my firm produced comparing um, the medium work ready days um, that it needs for a permit to be issued, a work permit to be issued. Um, and it goes from um, red to uh, very blue and blue is good and red is very slow. Um, and actually, when you look at the European map, it looks a bit like Germany is not too bad there. Um, so it's always interesting how national debates can um, go into a certain direction without very much looking left and right and, and even to the closest neighbors. Um, you see Germany here is in the middle. It's, it's kind of pale. Uh, doesn't really have a color, so uh, Germany sits somewhere here. Um, and there's a lot of red in Europe, and that is pre-COVID. I, I chose a 2019 one for this um, slide here, just to not have the, the data mixed up with, with the COVID situation. Um, um, so maybe uh, it's not all, it hasn't been all that bad, or um, at least um, Germany hasn't been uh, in, in the European comparison here has been um, on, on the lower part of things. Um, at the same time, uh, co too complex. That's something we heard a lot. And that was also um, put into the media as a, something easily digestible. No one can handle the system. It's utterly complex. No one, no one can operate it, neither the authorities, nor applicants, nor legal practitioners. Um, yeah, and then usually, uh, people um, will just say this, or if they are a bit more thorough, look through individual paragraphs, chapters in, in the employment ordinance where individual um, employment situations are regulated. And it has something like 30 odd paragraphs. Um, if you briefly look at the directory of visa categories at the Department of State's website of the United States, uh, I counted 70. Um, it sometimes changes uh, depending on um, how they present it and, and of course, of depending on legislation. Um, okay, but maybe the US is not that close to um, the, the countries of um, which, which Germany are uh, really looking at when it comes to the perfect system. Um, Australia is heard of a, more often as a, as a good example of a great immigration system. Um, United, uh, sorry, Australian Home Office, the Ministry of the Interior, has a website called Working in Australia. Just clicking through it, 22 work visa categories. Um, just to give a bit of a perspective, um, what is 
what is complex and what is not complex and how do other countries do it. Um, so then the OECD also had something to report. That's quite old now. Um, that's um, that's a couple of years old already, um, where the OECD found that well, the German blue card actually is working quite well, um, but there's difficulties with the medium skilled uh, bracket of immigration. Um, and actually, it's true that German blue card works very well. There's companies in Germany which have more blue cards issued per year than entire member states of the EU have issued um, and company employees of companies work larger companies working in Germany um, so I think I have forgotten the numbers but something like 80 or 90 percent of all EU blue cards I believe are German blue cards in in the EU so that's quite worked quite well there and this is already a reform more than eight years old now um, so an interesting picture overall. Some, thing, some things are good, other things may not be that bad. Um, some things are just average. Um, and this is kind of the larger perspective where the discussion took place in the last years. I just wanted to show you a couple of um, narratives and how, how I feel they, they need to be sorted in, into an international perspective. Um, another thing which um, I would like to point out is how the system overall works when it comes to labor migration into Germany. Um, and um, I dare to make three categories here rather than only two. Um, and this is something which um, is important because we really need to look at how, how actually the numbers are working in different visa categories. Um, of course, we have free movement, and so about half a billion people can just uh, enter Germany and live here and work here however they want. Um, and then we have uh, the rest of the world, we have all third countries. Um, and um, it's true that almost all other countries and citizens of all almost all other countries will have to go through the system which is in place and has been slightly reformed by the FEG, uh, which which looks at um, um, a very which has a very skilled based approach, which has only limited um, openings to um, to mid skilled migration, basically no uh, options for low skilled migration and, and quite good and liberal options to high to high skilled migration. But there's a little um, category in the middle. Um, which is best described by um, the positive discrimination of certain nationalities. Um, I um, have put some smileys onto this map um, to demonstrate what has kind of grown a settled um, term for that category, and that's the best friends work permit. Um, you don't find that in the law. It doesn't say best friends, but I, I think uh, I see Julia smiling. I think um, it's almost a, a accepted term by now um, for a um, group of for a, for a work permit category, which is basically a group of countries um, demonstrated here by the smileys, uh, which says um, citizens of that country can receive a work permit. Period. Um, it's roughly that, and um, this means that. Um, this is a discretionary permit and it's it's administered by the federal employment agency um it, it can also go through labor market test but it it's basically an administratively um shaped uh permit type which which does not have much requirements except having a certain citizenship um and it's it's important i, f I find to mention this because it's a totally different system from the skilled based um system of, for everyone else and uh, it's also important because that's more than half a billion people who have pretty liberal labor market access into Germany. That's something that you usually don't hear in the public discussions. But um, if you put all those more than half a billion people together, uh, for example, United States as the largest country, obviously, with more than half the population of those half a, more than half a billion um are a major factor for uh, skilled immigrants um into germany um and all other countries also we speak about um quite significant numbers of um employees coming into germany on on that ticket so um of course 
free movement is one thing, but apart from free movement, we, we really have two systems um, which are administering or, or which are shaping the overall um, immigration system. Um, another um, piece of it, um, speaking of uh, the, uh, the complexity of the system, um, there's actually a, quite a lot of authorities which can be involved in a migration um, process. Um, and um, it's uh, it's just to name a couple of them which are um, identified here by those errors. Um, it's usually two to three to four authorities which can play a role. Uh, the other authorities which don't have errors here, arrows here, um, just be, play a background administrative role, uh, but usually are also necessary players in the overall process. Um, and we have to add, we could actually add another element here, which is that those, those authorities are uh, on different levels of the state organization. Some of them are federal authorities and others are actually local county or city authorities um, with their own rules and, and laws, um, which makes it quite difficult also to set forward reform because um, the federal uh, lawgiver can only do so much to influence how the immigration office um, in um, Freiburg or um, Cologne is working. And that plays a huge role because at the end of the day, the local immigration office demonstrated here uh, as light blue is all is always part of the picture. Um, this is a little um, preview here into the world that we are now living in, uh, in the um, in under the FEG. Uh, we now have a third, not a, sorry, we have an additional authority. So um, the F the FEG um, is about making things easier. So the first step they did is to add another authority to that picture. Okay, this is a bit of a prelude of where we are in Germany and how the discussion is going, has been going in the last years. Um, to conclude, sorry, there's one final slide just to give you some numbers. Um, to conclude with some numbers from 2018, um, um, EU blue cards issued to newly arriving um, immigrants, not status changers, um, 12,000. Um, skilled immigrant visa, both ICT visas of different types. Um, we still have a very well working local ICT scheme, by the way, um, just as an asterisk to the last uh, presentation, which um, is still very popular and Germany doesn't really see much need to, to get rid of it in the favor of the ICT card. Um, but this is a different discussion. Um, and uh, also local higher visas about 22,000 uh, immigrants, um, a good chunk of them will be um, temporary uh, skilled migrants on assignment, of course. And then we have um, unskilled visas, about 22,000, which goes back into the best friends category, um, which has been by its nature extended into some countries of the Western Balkans recently in or like five years ago um, in, in response to the uh, what we call the refugee crisis, um, and this is actually producing a lot of numbers of immigrants as well. Uh, entrepreneur visa are um, um, not very significant when it comes to numbers. Um, what we also see here, um, I have the breakdown of uh, countries of origin. If we had the breakdown, sorry, I don't have it for the second category, just the skilled visas, it would be very similar. Um, there's some ICT categories which are dominated by India. Um, and um, we see the, the, the gap between the best or the, the highest and the second highest country, Russia, is um, on a factor of four, uh, more than four. So um, if you talk skilled migration, we often talk India in Germany. Okay. It's now live since 1st of March. Um, it came about on the basis of all this discussion. The last uh, large migration reform was in 2000, 2005, um, where the so-called Zuwanderungsgesetzpaket, a word 
pretty similar to immigration, but not quite um, was um, implemented. And um, it was the aim of the current coalition to reform the skilled part of the overall migration system again and more thoroughly, uh, which led to um, the government's master plan on migration, um, which was um, published earlier in 2018. And um, and then it went on into the drafting of the Fachkräfte Einwanderungsgesetz. There's also other laws which were first entangled with the FEG, uh, but then um, put away again for political reasons. Uh, we, there's it's a larger package which we I will not be focusing on today, just to keep it a bit um, slimmer. Uh, a larger package which also um, dealt with the questions of labor market access for asylum or denied asylum seekers in um, unclarified status and so on. Um, we had already discussed a bit of the terminology. I mean, the uh, the Federal Ministry of the Interior used the, the term Skilled Immigration Act, which I, I took here as well. But um, um, yeah, FEG is something I just also use in German and in English to, to make it easier and not introduce another abbreviation in English. Um, and it's also important to know it's not a new law. There's no new book which you can have in your hand, which is called Fachkräfte Einwanderungsgesetz. You may have that book in your hand and that's the foreigner's law. And um, what we have is just um, an update to the President's Act and other key um, elements of uh, the existing laws. Um, and it basically has three main um, pillars. It introduces some new uh, or amends existing work permit categories. It introduces new administrative processes and it adds um, quite a good amount of government audit and compliance uh, measures which lead to a bit more paperwork and notification requirements for employers and employees. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the core um, visa types, which actually produce the numbers, the EU blue card first and foremost, but also the ICT card, the EU ICT permit, and the national ICT scheme, the international staff exchange system, are have not seen any significant changes. There was a slight change in EU blue card when it comes to um, um, involvement of the Federal Employment Agency, but that is it when it comes to those um, those um, very important um, in terms of numbers um, permit categories. What it did though is define what um, is actually meant when we talk about a Fachkraft, which is a skilled immigrant or a skilled worker. Um, and that means also that um, anyone who does not fulfill those requirements cannot be considered a skilled worker and therefore kind of falls out of the system. Um, and it was made clear that a skilled worker is either a person with a recognized vocational training degree or a recognized um, academic degree, which can lead to the blue card. Also, what was defined is what, in kind, what kind of a position such a person uh, is supposed to immigrate into, and that is also uh, supposed to position the 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 reasoning of what or the definition is a bit circularly um, the definition of a position that you have to have that you have to demonstrate to in order to receive a visa is an employment which by types by its type requires the skills and qualifications of a skilled worker. So it's kind of a circle. The definition between the position and the person having the position. Um, of course, the other systems are still in place. We talked about this vast category of the best friends um, uh, or intracorporate transferees. Um, so the existing system has largely been changed for uh, the local hire system. The ICT system has not, has not been changed, and anyone who is not meeting this um, skilled worker definition, it doesn't mean they are not allowed to come anymore. It just means they are kind of systematically moved to the to the corner of of the law, and they have to take a jump from one um, from one chapter of the residence act into uh, the employment ordinance, which uh, still means it's possible, but they are they are not like in the middle of the of the of the action anymore um 
this of course doesn't mean they are not there's no demand for those visa types so uh, the new system is very nice and very stringent in itself but we will have to see if the numbers go the other route um, or if they go to, through those main categories which are known have now been defined um there was a different change um they just changed the, the polarization of whether labor market access is allowed or not and it went from generally being not allowed to generally being allowed which meant because they didn't want to open up everything that they had to go from plus to minus everywhere else uh, explicitly forbidding um, labor access where they didn't want to have it still because if in the future if if any lawgiver comes to an idea to uh, issue a new visa category and forget to regulate labor market access it would mean that they would have labor market access uh, but i'm sure they will not and so it's 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 nice but it doesn't doesn't change much in practice um and um, also they even further reduced the extent of uh, labor market testing. Um, it's, it's become in, in the skilled field, it's now a negligible element which doesn't play a very high role. It does still play a role in the unskilled field, field where uh, through the discretionary permit system um, privileging certain citizenships, it's still possible to um, migrate into Germany. Uh, also for low skilled or unskilled positions, but then a uh, labor market test can be applied. Um, this is maybe a bit small, I'm not sure if this is easy to see. Um, we have had other categories, um, further categories also being implemented. Basically what they try to do is go through each um, level of skill, university degree, vocational training, um, and no, not none of these two things and always open up the option to get training or education, to get employment and to um, receive a job search um, visa. So job searching is now also possible for um, skilled workers with a vocational training background. Um, and but that is largely it um it has been possible to do all the other things as well in the past that just went to also introducing another um permit category for search of an vocational training um so not even searching employment but searching for um a, well it is employment but um to to look for um an ausbildung uh, in germany so to become uh, whatever kind of a carpenter or electrician and um but these permits are i don't don't think anyone thinks they will produce numbers in the thousands and tens of thousands per year these are i would say most of them are good tries to have a stringent system and to open up as much as possible in all that there's especially when it comes to the mid-skilled there's one big i would say elephant in the room which is going to be a showstopper mostly and we're going to talk about it later there, I want to point out specifically two new visa categories which have been introduced. Um, firstly, they um, came to the conclusion that in the field of IT, it's quite common that um, people who have trained themselves or who have, been, uh, have not finished their degree are still in demand. And therefore, they um, introduced a visa category for experienced IT professionals without a formalized degree um, and, and then the, the requirement is that they at least can demonstrate they have worked in this field and um, have B1 levels. Um, B1 actually is quite high um, for uh, an industry where in many cases no English at all is required. Um, but what we see is um, uh, this requirement can be waived and we were afraid it would be very difficult to waive it but we see uh, the authorities are pretty liberal. Um, if you just uh, have a thorough confirmation saying that the, for the completion of the job is not re required to speak um, German, it's possible to waive that requirement. They also um, introduced, and that is true for the second immigration category as well, they introduced um, minimum salary levels for um, uh, applicants of a certain age. Um, just to make sure that the, the German welfare state um, would be protected from any potential um, lo future losses, uh, for example, for by not having enough um, pension saved up. 
The second um, category I want to point out, we have talked about it already, um, is um, um, a, the immigration category for uh, immigrants with vocational training background. Um, and um, but like the first one as well, it's been produced uh, or introduced a bit as a new thing um, and a totally um, totally new approach uh, which hasn't been there before. That's actually untrue for both those categories um, and especially untrue for the second because it's been around before as well. The only thing that has been waived is um, or the key thing that has been waived, and that's the big difference, is that there used to be a white list of um, jobs which are were considered on high demand, where you had to be on in order to be uh, eligible for a visa. Um, and this white list has now been abolished, so it doesn't matter which profession, which industry one is in, it's always possible to receive that um, vocational training visa. Uh, actually, the first casualty category has been around in a kind of similar way until a couple of years ago. Um, it was regulated in the employment ordinance um, and then had been taken out because uh, they thought it's not useful anymore, or not necessary anymore. Um, they could have also decided to um, use the blue card directive in a way that it could have allowed to receive a blue card based on experience, but they didn't want to go this way. Um, the same here, also for number two, they have introduced a minimum salary um, requirement for applicants of a certain age. Um, in all those cases, of course, and that is still true for the entire German system, except for the job search permits, that uh, it's required to have an uh, employment offer or an employment offer signed uh, in order to be eligible for a visa. Let's move to employer compliance aspects. Um, one uh, kind of unfortunate thing I would say is um, the denial or the review reasons and denial reasons which the uh, Federal Employment Agency uh, is supposed to apply when reviewing an application has been extended, um, which leads to new forms uh, and new, uh, um, and new um, attestation requirements from employers, um, where uh, actually that comes from the denial reasons from the ICT direct Directive and they were first only applicable to the ICT card in Germany. And then uh, the, the government thought, this is such a great idea, let's use those extended uh, um, review um, elements for the, for the Federal Employment Agency for all kinds of approval uh, processes. So now uh, it's important to also prove compliance with uh, tax, social security, employment law, and so on. Um, there's one element I, I'm speaking about it in a, I don't want even to speak about it in a kind of derogatory way. It's, it's all part of a maturization of the immigration system, I would say. Um, and it leads to a bit more transparency and flexibility, I'm sorry, not flexibility, transparency and uh, accountability both on the side of the employer and on the, on the side of the um, authorities, I would say. So uh, it's part, I would say, of a professionalization of what the employment agency does and also a bit more a, a tendency to bringing the employer into the picture. Um, until now, the employer has been kind of a sidekick to the individual um, application of the employee and has not been part of it um, or not to a significant extent. Now with those um, compliance checks which have to be done for each and every application, the employer has to come a bit more forward and to the surface and plays a larger role. May it also be only with obligations right now. Um, and we also see the Federal Employment Agency has to grow into this new obligation and to, into this new system. Um, I remember when the ICT card was implemented and those checks were already asked for from the employer, they, they just stated, uh, do, have you ever had tax issues in your company? Uh, well, there's companies in Germany which are older than Germany because Siemens was uh, founded in the 30s, I believe, of the 19th century, of course, they have had a tax issue in this company before. And then they had to learn that they have to limit those questions somehow uh, and to, to make it possible to comply with the rules. Um, there's also another element which, which adds more um, 
tools onto the table of the federal employment agency and how it can look into things. So the employment agency has now also been uh, given a tool to e review uh, applications and review uh, the the compliance with um, data given um, uh, confirmations given post visa uh, approval, um, even in cases where they hadn't been involved before. So we see a bit of a compliance and audit um, function uh, growing there slowly. I'm going to jump over this one there's another um oblig obligation to notify employers uh, sorry uh, immigration offices if the employment ends ahead of time uh, it's been there before but it's now it's coming with a fine as well um and i'm moving to processes um so um there's about 600 odd immigration offices in germany because each county and each larger city has one um, and they're always part of the process at the end and sometimes also in the beginning or in the middle and um, compared to the quite well organized federal authorities like the federal employment agency it's impossible to say uh, to, to easily um, rule over those more than 600 immigration officers because they're just doing their own thing and usually they're the slowest and least um, professional, I would say, um, piece in the chain of, um, of authorities, um, which led to um, the authorities, uh, the immigration offices being removed more and more from the process in the last years. Um, but now the immigration offices come back um, or are, were supposed to come back with new statewide central immigration offices for work permit processing. Um, so it was thought that it would be a good idea to have the German states um, introduce specific centralized authorities which only do work permit processing and um, would especially uh, deal with the uh, fast track process, which we are coming to in a couple of minutes. Um, and um, that was the idea of the federal lawgiver. And the, the states didn't like it that much. Um, and um, especially the southern states, um, were not uh, and or are still reluctant to introduce such central immigration offices. Um, this is a bit interesting because um, the Ministry of the Interior is at the moment in the hands of the um, Christian Social Union, which is the conservatives from Bavaria. But Bavaria itself said, no, we have no interest in uh, central immigration offices. Um, and um, we have to see how it works. Other states did it and others will do it. Um, if there's no central immigration offices, it stays at the regular system, which says that the local immigration office has to be involved. Um, but we have to really see this in, in, in the context of the new fast track process, because otherwise you don't really need uh, the, the immigration offices that much for the work visa process anymore, which is a good thing, because the less authorities involved in the process, the better. So imagine all those central immigration offices were largely put in place with the thought of them dealing with um, the new fast track process and uh, the beschleunigte Fachkräfteverfahren. and this process um, is now in place um, we don't have very much experience with it yet because of largely corona um, and the idea is um, there is a the local immigration office or if a German state has introduced the central immigration office, the central immigration office are to be the contact point, the steering point and um, the consultation point for any employer who intends to hire a foreign national um, and against a fee of 411 euros they can um, have this um, management service of the local immigration or central immigration office to gather and steer all the other um, authorities involved um, be the only point of contact to the employer and then um, um, finalize an approval which then is sent to uh, the embassy or consulate for fast visa issuing. Um, and this is um, a good idea. Um, it could well work, um, especially in cases where there's many other authorities involved, federal employment agency, degree recognition authority, professional um, recognition authority, whatever it could be, it could be a lot. And um, it's 
can be a good idea to have a local point of contact for um, employers. It's largely going to be um, interesting for uh, SMEs, Mittelstand, um, large employers with huge programs are usually able to steer and organize the system and yeah, organize, conduct the system themselves. Um, at the same time, even for large employers, or no matter the size of the employer, one thing is interesting, and that is the legally uh, defined processing times for the other authorities, especially for um, the consulates. Um, so um, firstly, if you approach a, a local immigration office, uh, paying them for it 11 euros, um, the Federal Employment Agency um, is supposed to approve that application um, upon request of the immigration office within one week. The regular uh, deadline is two weeks. And then we have um, processing times for the consulate as well, once the approval has been sent out by the immigration office. So it's supposed to, the consulate is supposed to organize a visa appointment within three weeks and then um, approve the visa within another three weeks. Um, it's all a nice idea. It's a bit um, difficult in so far as the employer actually is, well, to, to, my, to my earlier point, it's good that the employer can play a role. At the same time, the employer by law, how it's set up, is uh, appearing on behalf of the employee and has, have, has to have power of attorney from the employee. So the employee is still in the background. And uh, that approval that is, is obtained here is not an approval which can be um, actioned in courts because it's not um, an official, um, um, it's not an official part of the visa process where um, um, it's possible to um, have legal remedies uh, in case there's a denial. So um, it's it's unfortunately not possible for the um, employer on behalf of the employee to um, action any denials in the in the and, and receive legal protection easily uh, at courts. Um, with that said, I move on to um, a couple of other points, um, which I believe are very important because um, all the new categories, all the new processes. At the end of the day, capacity is one of the most important elements of successful labor migration systems. Um, and the capacity and the training of civil servants is key to the processing times. Um, and we see that um, there's some changes. Um, things get digitalized, which is good. Um, there's a new, a new visa application form online now. It's not going to a cloud yet, but at least you can um, it, you can um, type your data in and it can be read by a scanner uh, from with the visa officer. There's now also a new um, authority called um, Federal Authority for Foreign Affairs, which is uh, um, being placed in, into Brandenburg near Berlin and it's supposed to help with visa processing as well. So visa um, uh, officers uh, around the globe could be um, using that capability as well. And uh, other elements uh, or other authorities, especially dealing with uh, nursing as well as with um, degree recognition processes. Um, to come to um, the, the, um, the impact of the law, um, we have um, seen that overall the system has not been fully changed. Um, it's just not true that um, as it has been portrayed also by party politics that by now suddenly Germany has a, has a labor migration system. It has had it before. It's just untrue. It's a nice update to the current system with a couple of things which will probably not work very well and other things which make things easier. Um, and um, I think most important almost is um, this, um, what, what I earlier called the overall maturization of the system. There's more compliance, there's more transparency, um, there's more things that can um, be um, actioned by authorities, um, there's more um, notification and transparency regulations for employers. And I think this is um, a thing which will, if even if it's a hassle for employers at, the, at, the, at any given time, 
it will lead to authorities becoming more professional with labor migration. Um, the fast track process, we'll have to see. Um, it, it, um, it must show its effect, and but it can certainly be helpful for Mittelstand companies. Yeah, and basically just going on here. Um, firstly, it's, it's just important, especially when it comes to the visa categories and the quantities they may generate. It's been Corona, so it, we will have to give it another year or more to see, or probably to, you know, to wait until data of 2022 um, before we can see how things work. Um, and the same for the fast track process. Um, it's been a, as, as a very slow start. Probably that's been better for the immigration offices because they hadn't been properly prepared and wouldn't have been able to to handle uh, many applications from the beginning anyway. Um, what we see is the starting of the of the FTP is sometimes difficult because unfortunately the the lawgiver um, did not include legal answering times and deadlines for the beginning of the process. Once that agreement is signed with the employer, then they start. But we have had cases where there was a huge back and forth from first contact to agreement signed, which took weeks. Um, and but we again there it could be different in a year's time um and um also i i would say the central immigration offices have been a failure um and i'm also saying thankfully so but because i i don't think they would have take given any big effect and if we say um bavaria baden württemberg and hesse have opted out we basically say the central immigration offices are dead for labor migration because 50 to 55 percent, 60 percent, I don't know exactly the numbers, of blue card people move into the larger Munich, Stuttgart, Rhine, Main areas. And um, therefore, if those three countries uh, or states opt out, it's not worth very much. Yeah, up trends again a bit. Um, what what we see is that um, for once for those for, for the fast track process, the immigration offices play a larger role. I I I don't think this is a good idea to to enforce further because it's th those gigantic number of immigration offices will never be properly steered from Berlin. It's always going to be a very volatile system where you not don't know what you will get. Uh, it's just too too granular to properly um, control a system, um, and and also that idea of the immigration of the centralized immigration offices, but also the entire um, system of the degree recognition is a large problem still. And I would say if there is one showstopper for mid-skilled migration. Um, or any migration actually at the moment, it's not the migration laws anymore, it's the, the, it's the professional um, and degree recognition laws. Those processes are much, much harder. Uh, the interests to change them are close to zero because at any aisle of the spectrum, of the political spectrum, you will find people who will say, no, no, we, we only want qualified immigrants. It's, it's an argument which can be played easily both from the left and from the right uh, with different um, um, tones and, and, and aims. Uh, but at the same time, it will always end up that um, degree recognition uh, is something which is highly upheld. Um, I think it's been so in Germany. Um, with with um, strong independent chambers, uh, basically a system which has been around since hundreds of years. Uh, that that uh, that um, certain professions, um, as well as chambers of industry and commerce, have uh, those are all bodies which have little interest in free competition from a gigantic variety of global uh, backgrounds and qualifications. Um, so this is actually the bottleneck and this i think will also lead to um the mid-skilled migration categories to be not very very um significant in numbers um unless germany really changes its approach and will find it okay that um a carpenter from nigeria who is a perfect wonderful carpenter but may have never seen something what what we call duala ausbildung or dual training 
will very it's very hard for such a person to receive a, a visa um, and as long as we have a qualification recognition system which looks at the formal um, qualifications and the degrees rather than at what people can do and we have skills based tests of qualifications uh, it's, I think it will be hard. Um, and then um, I've called it Ordnungspolitik, which is a which, which is a, a German word um, for describing how um, well order should be applied into certain um, complex systems. Um, that this these two systems, the best friend system on the one hand versus this very formalistic skilled worker system on the other hand. I think this is something. Um, which I hope the government is aware of that those two categories exist really as two very contradicting systems. And um, if they're aware of it and play with it well, I think it can be interesting to see how it will work in the future. Um, and with that, I would say also in terms of the time, thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to your questions. <laughs>